So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Amy Christensen Janicki. Um, she is the Records Management Liaison at the Indiana Archives and Records Administration. And thank you very much, Amy, for joining us today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to start your presentation. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be here. Like Jeanette said, my name is Amy Christensen Janicki. I work for the Indiana Archives and Records Administration, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about county, local, government, records, uh, management, and that sort of thing. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And of course, for some reason, I did not have my PowerPoint pulled up. So give me two shakes of a lamb's tail. Okay, does everyone see my PowerPoint? Yep, looks good. All right, perfect, okay. So, um, like I said, I am here to talk about our county local uh, records management for government agencies. I usually do about a 30 minute presentation and like Jeanette said, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, and before I get started, I wanted to uh, make a little caveat about what I'm gonna be talking about. So I am the records management liaison um, for specifically for county local government agencies. Um, I give a lot of presentations to agencies like the county clerk's office or the recorders, the county recorders, um, public libraries, those sorts of county local agencies. Um, and those agencies work with records um, during their active life cycle. So they, um, where records are created, uh, dis distributed, actively stored and retained by those agencies. So I know a lot of you are county historians and other local historical entities. Um, so you might be dealing with records that are at the end of their life cycle or inactive. Uh, records where um, they might be at their disposition time or uh, are beginning to be archived records um, that are, you know, historically valuable but no longer retained by those uh, county local agencies that I work with. And they might transfer those records to you. So um, I've tweaked my presentation a little bit so that hopefully um, although some of the information might not be pertinent to you, that um, you can see where um, these active records are in their life cycle and where they go after disposition. Um, they're not necessarily guidelines for you as county historians, but I think it'll give you an idea of where the record um, goes, how the record goes through its life cycle before it comes to your county archives or your historical society or your muse your local museum. So I just want to make you aware of that and we'll get started here. So just a brief overview of what I am going to be talking to you about today. Um, I will give you a rundown of what the Indiana Archives and Records Administration uh, can provide you. Then I'll tell you a little bit about my position and what I do as the records management liaison. And I'll then also talk about records management in general and um, then talk about retention schedules and different state forms. And finally, I'll talk about the County Commission of Public Records. You um, might be more familiar with the County Commission, so um, Anyway, those are the few things I will be talking about. So what is IARA? Uh, the Indiana Archives and Records Administration assists state, state and local governments in the cost-effective, efficient, and secure management of governmental records by providing services throughout the life cycle of records, including creation, use, records inventory, and scheduling, storage, and disposition. 
Um, IARA was formerly known as the Indiana Commission on Public Records, the ICPR. Um, so if you know it by that name, uh, we changed, it was officially renamed IARA in 2015. So just um, about six years ago, actually. Um, these are the different divisions in IARA. I'll um, go into more detail about records management shortly, but um, that division, we have the state side and the local government side. Um, we develop records retention schedules. We um, provide online public access to those schedules. And we also work with the different government agencies and employees to apply those schedules to their actual records. The State Records Center works primarily with state government agencies and they provide temporary storage and document circulation for inactive records. And then <clears throat> the Indiana State Archives um, permanently collects legally and historically valuable Indiana government records they provide public access to those records that are not confidential by law, and they maintain secure storage of microfilm negatives. So some of you are probably uh, more familiar with the Indiana Archives or work with them more regularly. The Electronic Records Program, they advise government agencies on the management of their electronic record formats and systems. They develop policies and procedures uh, for electronic records, and I'll talk a little bit more about the electronic records program later in the presentation. And then the conservation lab um, is located at the State Archives in the building photograph there. Um, they restore and repair legally and historically valuable records. They serve as a resource for disaster preparedness and emergency planning. And they also advise government agencies on proper records preservation methods. So um, the conservation lab uh, might be a good resource for you all if you have um, repairs that need to be made to some of your archival records and that sort of thing. The Imaging and Microfilm Services Lab, they perform preservation microfilming on critical records, and they also handle uh, damaged or delicate records for microfilming. Um, they convert critical microfilm and paper-based records to digital access formats as technology and work environments change. And they also preserve digital records by writing files to microfilm as a secure backup file to content management systems. The forms management division, they assign master number or state form numbers to all official state government agency forms, both paper and electronic. They maintain a master file folder and database record for each state form. And they also design forms for agencies and analyze and approve the design of agency created forms. And there are two state forms that I will be going more in depth about that forms management has created for county local agencies. And then lastly, the Oversight Committee on Public Records. Um, they approve schedules for government agencies they vote on policies and administrative rules for IARA, and they are designated by Indiana Code. They are, um, the Oversight Committee on Public Records is basically the state level of your county commission. So they're, they're over the whole state. So there are two records management sections. There are the state and the county local. And I, like I said, I'm under the county local. Um, and we provide assistance and education for Indiana government offices in managing, retaining, preserving, and disposing of public records. Like I said, we develop and update records retention schedules that balance the storage needs of the government office with state and federal retention requirements, as well as the need for preservation of documents with permanent historical value. We offer some online training modules, um, some publications and policies. 
I mention the County Local Records Custodian Handbook because um, it is a great, great useful resource that I use on a daily basis. Um, it talks about all the different sorts of county local information on records management that you could need. So um, I highly recommend reviewing that. Um, and then policy 20-01 and 20-02 are electronic records policies. I'll talk about those in a little bit. All right, so I am the records management liaison for the county local agencies. I was hired last June during the pandemic. Um, I have a background in archives though, so I am new to records management and I, um, I've worked previously as an archivist. Um, I have a master's degree in history and archival studies from Auburn University in Alabama. I then worked as an archivist in Alabama for about four years before I moved to Indiana and got a job as a project archivist up in Northern Indiana at the Elkhart County Historical Museum. I worked there for a few years and then um, got this job and moved down to Indianapolis. So here I am. Um, shout out to Michelle, my old coworker at the ECHM. I think she's on the call. So I had a lovely time working there and I'm um, glad to be here uh, to be your liaison as well. Um, when I was hired, I was hired specifically to help the county clerks, all 92 county clerks in the state. And I was going to be doing a lot of state travel, but with COVID, of course, that did not happen. So we had to rethink how I would be accessible to those clerks. And one of the ways we came, one of the things we came up with was doing a weekly email blast about records management and different topics that have been brought up by clerks or different issues or um, updates on schedules, that sort of thing. I would send a brief email out. I do it on Monday mornings, perfect time. Um, so if you ever, if you would like to see those emails or be included um, in that blast on Monday mornings, feel free to email me and just say subscribe me, I'll know what you're talking about. There's an email address there, cty at iara.in.gov, and I'd be glad to include you in that. Um, and now that now that everything's opening up and the pandemic is not as, as um, you know, slowing down, uh, we're starting, uh, well, I am starting to do state travel for the first time, um, probably at the end of July, August. So if you would like a site visit, if you think it would be helpful, I might do that as well. Um, and then another thing I'm developing is a monthly uh, chat on Microsoft Teams for anyone who has questions about records management. Uh, it'll just be like a 30 minute conversation. I was gonna talk about the different emails I sent out for the month and then open it up, you know, for whoever wants to pop in. So that's another opportunity to talk with me or chat with your questions or concerns. All right. So what is records management? So in general, records management for state and county local agencies is loosely defined as taking care of government records and retaining them under the requirements set out by the state of Indiana and federal laws using records retention schedules developed for you by IARA. There are three main reasons why every office in Indiana government needs an effective records management program. The first is to perform its legal mandates and responsibilities. The second is to minimize the cost of records storage. And the third is to assure public access to the documentary evidence of government. I have a couple of examples I wanted to give you about um, why these three reasons are so important. The first one is um, I had a county contact me last year that they have a county hospital that was purchased by a private institution and they have about 50 years of records in the 
all over the, the hospital that are technically county records and not to be kept with the private hospital that they needed to figure out what to do with. Um, so they have endeavored on this project of inventorying their records, figuring out if they need to be um, kept permanently or destroyed after so many years or could be transferred to um, the archives or a local historical entity like some of you probably uh, associate with. So um, that's one reason, you know, um, that that's one one example of why having an effective records management program is a beneficial to government. Um, another one is there was a school with um, a basement. They were actually moving buildings and they had a basement full of records that they didn't um, you know retain properly. There were records there that could have been destroyed, you know, like, 10 years ago. So that's, um, that minimizes, you know, you need to minimize the cost of storage as well. And especially when you're moving, it helps, um, helps with that. And then my last example, um, one of the counties contacted, um, or I think it was a lawyer actually that contacted me, but one of the counties did get in some legal trouble because they didn't keep their personnel files um, for the proper amount of time. Personnel files have a, a retention period of 75 years after the employee is, is no longer employed with the agency. So it's kind of a semi-permanent record. 75 years is a long time. So um, that definitely would, um, if you have an effective records management program, um, you won't get into legal trouble like that. So those are just some reasons reasons for that. And then um, these county local agencies that I, I'm talking about, um, you have different partners that can help you. Specifically IARA, the Archives and Records Administration, your County Commission of Public Records, which I'll talk about a little bit late, later. So you're not alone in your records management, um, records management problems. So at the heart of records management, of course, is the record. A record is a public government uh, record is any piece of recorded information that is created or received by your office and documents activities of your office, no matter what media it's recorded on or what format it's recorded in. A public government record is based on the type of information, not the media or format. And when I say not the media or format, media is the physical storage object or type of container. So an example of media would be paper or microfilm or CD. The format is how the information is arranged. So if it's arranged on a program like Microsoft Word or on a file type like PDF or TIFF. So it's not about whether or not it's on paper or a CD or it's a PDF or um, on Microsoft Word, that sort of thing. It's all about the type of information. And public, public records don't necessarily mean that they are fully accessible to the public. Uh, government records can be um, public, they can be confidential, and they can also be partially confidential. And then I've told you what a record is, and now I want to tell you what a non-record is because uh, that's important as well. So a non-record is any piece of recorded information you might have in your government office that does not document the activities of your office or is a duplicate of information that is a public record. Um, and that's just a short overview of what a non-record is. And then I also want to talk about uh, the copy of record and, a, and duplicates. So when you're dealing um, when you're dealing with duplicates, whether they're in the same format as the original or a different format, you'll need to determine which version is the copy of record. And this is something that these lo county local 
agencies are doing, um, not necessarily on a daily basis, but this is just um, some background on how, how they figure out their copy of record and duplicates. So, so the copy of record does not need to be the original. It doesn't even need to remain the same copy over the lifetime of a record. If you duplicate a paper record in microfilm format, you might decide that the microfilm is now record of copy and destroy the paper originals. The, cop the, the copy of record is whichever version of the information the office currently uses to fulfill the legal retention requirements for that type of information. So there may be a clerk's office in your county that has microfilmed um, some records and their paper copies have become their duplicate. And you might find those in the the dumpster or shredded or something. So they have, they have, their microfilm has become their copy of record and the duplicates they are allowed to get rid of um, without permission from IARA because we only care about keeping that copy of record. Right. So electronic records are any records created, maintained, altered, or deleted in a digital format. These records are subject to the same record keeping requirements as a paper record. So like I said, it doesn't matter the media or format, um, it's, the, it's the information. So um, like I said, there's policies 20-01 and 20-02. These are policies that were created last year that replaced some older policies and they, they were created to ensure electronic records are retained in a trustworthy, accessible and appropriate manner and to establish consistent standards for the creation and maintenance of public electronic records. The electronic records storage and file management um, best practices. This is um, still in draft form, um, so it's not official yet, but it's it's definitely a, um, a good overview and best practices for e-records. And if you would like a copy of that, you can contact the e-records email there or Megan Fukunaga, who is the deputy director of the electronic records program. And she gave me some advice to share with you. Um, and this can go for county local agencies or for you as county historians or local entities. Um, in a nutshell, you know, give files and folders descriptive names, devote time to cleaning and organizing file storage locations, whether they are in the cloud or not, keep personal items to a bare minimum, know what your responsibilities are for maintaining files over the long term, and understand file formats will be your best bet. I mentioned the County Local Records Custodian Handbook earlier. The handbook has several pages um, about e-records um, that could answer some of your questions. So if you look at pages 22 through 26, um, that will might be helpful for you. So records retention is a uh, best practice is a practice by which organizations maintain records for a set length of time and then employ a system of actions to either redirect, store, or dispose of them. Why is records retention important? Uh, good, good records retention prevents audit findings and possibly prevents damages in a lawsuit. And um, important records should be available and easily accessible when needed. I know I've mentioned that before, but just having good records retention, records management um, is a very good idea. <laughs> so record uh, retention schedules um, go along with records retention and they are schedules um, that tell you how long the law uh, says you need to keep various categories of records and, and documents when we create or, re or receive an Indian government and what to do with them after that. Um, and the name we use for those categories is record series. 
And basically, retention schedules are lists of record series. Each retention schedule contains all of the record series that apply either to that specific government entity or to a broad category of government entity. Uh, the Indiana government records are covered by five different types of retention schedules. And as um, since I help just the county local agencies, there are really only two of the five retention schedules that they need to know. Those are the county local and the office specific retention schedules. Um, some of you may deal with court records or um, have questions about court records. Those are maintained by the Indiana Judiciary. They are under the judicial retention schedule, which is not managed by IARA. It's by the Indiana Judiciary. And um, if you have questions about those, you can direct them to Mr. Tom Jones um, or I'll forward them to him. We have a, we have a good working relationship. So. Um, so the county local and the office specific retention schedules. The county local, it lists very common record series that may be created or received by any Indiana local government unit, um, offices at the county, municipal, and other lab, local level, no matter what services they provide. So it's a very, um, a general retention schedule that can, can cover all, like all local government units. The office specific retention schedule, they list record series um, that may be created or received um, by a certain type of county or local office. So like all of the county clerks have their own office specific retention schedule, all the public libraries have their own, all local law enforcement agencies, they have their own, that sort of thing. And I just want to let you know that retention schedules are always being updated um, and made better for that local, that county local agency. So, so record series are records that share the same topic, legal requirements, and retention instructions, and they're grouped together under a single record series. And each record series in, contains a record series number, a title and description, and a retention period and disposition instructions. So there's an example on the screen from the county clerk's um, retention schedule. You'll know it's a county clerk's one because if you look under record series, it says CL and that's short for clerks. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the, the different. Um, so a record series number, that's CL 10-17. It's a unique identification number assigned when the series is first created. The title and description that says bail agent license slash power of attorney. This is a formal name for the category of records and a brief description of the subject or program that the records have in common, specific forms and reports that may be included, and any legal codes that affect confidentiality or retention periods. So this um, title and description is self-explanatory. Some of the other ones actually have like a paragraph and will say exactly what is included in that record series. And then the retention period and disposition instructions. This one says to destroy three years after expiration of license. Um, so this is the where and what format and how long the records are to be maintained and what happens at the end of that period. So. Um, it, they could be uh, destruction of records that are no longer useful, or they could be transferred to the Indiana State Archives for records of historical value, um, or even transferred to a local historical entity as well. So I wanted to go a little bit more in depth on the retention periods. Um, 
So retention periods are the details on what the government office must do with scheduled records. Um, the instructions under the retention period are written as briefly and straightforwardly as possible so that the records custodian or the county local agency can understand what they need to do to fulfill their legal requirements towards the records and that no records are accidentally disposed of improperly or too soon. Um, these uh, instructions, they may include format conversion instructions, uh, information on how long the records need to remain, and what finally happens to the records after their retention period is over. So format conversion instructions are whether and when to microfilm original paper records. Microfilming records is almost always optional, um, so it won't be mentioned in most retention periods, but you will see it, see it um, on records that have been designated critical. And then, um, so what finally happens to your records after their retention period is over? Like I said, uh, destruction is an option, some of them, like this example I have here, destroyed three years after expiration of license, or um, transfer of records to the Indiana archives or our county local entity. That way, um, archivists, which some of you might be, or county historians like yourselves, can work to preserve those records. Um, you might weed or sample or evaluate those records and retain only those items with permanent value for your collections. So once it's been transferred, the county local agency really um, has no, no say over, over the records. All right. Um, so like I said, county local, several county local agencies have their office specific retention schedule. This one is the clerks, the CL1, um, and it's specific to the clerks, like I said. Um, not all county local agencies will have this, so that's why they would turn to the, the general, general retention schedule. Um, so they would they would look at their, so they have a record that they're trying to find. They'll look at this clerk's schedule. If they can't find it there. They'll then turn to their, the general retention schedule. And when they can't find it there, they contact me and I will double check the schedules and um, see if they're on a record series or, or if not, we'll, we'll go from there. So that's just an example of the office specific for the clerks. And then this is what the, the general retention schedule looks like and, and um, the different categories that are on that schedule. So they have administrative, accounting and finance, personnel, publications and reports, audio, video, and general media. So this, like I said, it's applicable to all offices, all county local offices. And then I briefly want to mention different county um, and local retention schedules. So, you know, the assessors, the auditors, the coroner, treasurer, um, the public safety agencies like uh, the fire department and the police and EMTs, they all have these office specific schedules that they look at. But there are also other local schedules as well. Cities and towns have their own office specific. The township trustee that you might work with a lot, they have their own. Um, educational institutions is for all the K through 12 schools, that sort of thing. And several of these schedules, um, like the schools, they're continually being updated because you know schools create a lot of different forms and um, we always have to adjust when that happens. Okay, so um, let's say a, a county local agency has, um, has found, has looked at their schedules, has found or not found the correct record series for their record, um, and they reviewed their retention periods. So now what? So they 
they may need to use these state forms um, to destroy or dispose of their records. And like I said before, state forms are created by the Forms Management Division of IARA. These are the two state forms. That's what FSF is short for, state form, um, that they will most likely use. So for state form 44905 is Notice of Destruction, or called for short NOD. And state form 30505 is, or called PR1. Um, so the Notice of Destruction, um, it is, its official title is Notice of Destruction of County Local Government Records in Accordance with an Approved Retention Schedule. So those records that are found on those record series um, that say destroy after so-and-so, this is the form that they use to destroy those records. The PR1 is mostly used for records that are not found on those record series or retention schedules. So they're what we call unscheduled records and um, they don't fill out one of these PR1s until after they've looked at both of their schedules and after they've contacted me to double check and make sure it's not on a record series. And these forms um, were recently updated. They've been updated multiple times, but they were most recently updated last summer. So um, I just make sure that all county local agencies are aware of the updates. And there's a link there if you want to check out those forms. And I'll go a little bit more in depth here. So the NOD, like I said, is a form to be used only for documenting the destruction of records as scheduled on an approved county local records retention schedule. So an agency might have revenue receipts from 2000 to 2010. And so they looked at their office specific, they couldn't find it there. They turned to the county local general and they found a record series. As you can see the example there, Gen 1010 basic accounting records dash revenue. So they found the correct record series and they review the retention period, which says destroy, delete after six years and after receipt of a state board of accounts audit report and satisfaction of unsettled charges. So basically they can destroy and delete after six years and after an audit. So they have receipts from 2000 to 2010. So that's definitely six years. And so that's when they get this NOD form. They can find it on our website or they can contact me for it. And they will fill out the contact information on there. They'll put this record series, the Gen 10-10, and they'll submit the form to, to me at IARA. Um, after that, they will wait 30 days for IARA to approve it. Um, and basically what happens is after the 30 days, if they have not heard from me or anyone at IARA about their form, that is permission or approval to destroy the records. So on the, basically on the 31st day, they can destroy those records. And then the form, there's a little section at the bottom, destruction information that they have to fill out and then submit that to their county commission and keep one for their office records. So that was about the NOD, about destroying records that are scheduled. A little bit more about the PR1 because this might be a form that you are used to dealing with more. So the PR1 form, um, actually local county local agencies might not use it as much as the NOD, but it has um, several different uses. Um, and the PR1, the main use is that it is for records that are not, not scheduled. Um, so it's to dispose of unscheduled records. And the two other, two other um, ways you can use the PR1 is to transfer a scheduled record to the state archives or transfer it to a local historical entity. 
So um, we always ask that the agency reach out to the state archives first. I like to say that the state archives has dibs <laughs> and then um, and then they can ask their, lo their um, local historical society or their local museum or, you know, if they would like those records transferred to them. And um, so the, like I, like I said earlier, the NOD, the destruction form is approved by us at IARA, but this form, the PR1 is approved by the county commission. So the agency would fill out this form and then submit it to the county commission. And then the county commission can approve um, approve or deny the request. And um, that's when the form will come, come to us. We will double check everything. And, um, and then there is a 60 day waiting period until the records could either be disposed of or transferred to the, um, to the local historical society. Oops. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the County Commission of Public Records because um, I'm thinking you all probably, probably uh, deal with that a little more. Um, the County Commission of Public Records receives and processes records, disposition notices and requests. So the two forms I told you about, the NOD and the PR1 forms, they get those from the government offices in their county and they meet at least once per calendar year. Um, IARA does encourage the county commissions to meet more often than that so that localities and offices uh, they serve can dispose of their records in a timely and efficient manner. Um, so like I said, they have to meet at least once a year per Indiana code. They must have a quorum to hold a meeting which is four um, committee members. They are open to the public. So if you as county historians would like to see what your county local agencies are um, destroying or getting rid of that sort of thing, you can go to these meetings. The secretary of the meeting is either the county clerk or the county recorder. And I do keep a list of a yearly list of, uh, of the secretaries. So if you want to contact that that person, I can help you with that. And then there's also a chairperson for the for the meetings, and um, they are elected from the county commission members. I know a lot of times um, it's the circuit court judge that is the chairperson, but it can be anyone who is um, a commission member. And then here is the Indiana code that establishes the membership of the county commission. You've got the circuit court judge or his designee, his or her designee, the um, president of the board of county commissioners or the designee, the auditor, the, the clerk, the recorder, superintendent of schools, and then either the city controller or the clerk treasurer. And um, if, if one of the members cannot attend the meeting or they have a a scheduling conflict. That's why we have the designee there. So there's someone in, in their office that knows um, records retention and that sort of thing they can attend in their, in their stead. And the county commissions, um, several of them were not able to meet last year with COVID, um, but we did encourage people to meet virtually. Uh, a lot of people actually liked like the virtual option, um, but it seems like everything's returning to normal. So they should be having in-person meetings soon. And then lastly, a little bit about um, the County Local Records Custodian Handbook. Um, it is designed to help county and local government offices in Indiana properly and legally care for the public records in their custody. It uh, has replaced two previous publications. Um, so just that you're aware of that. And then we do have an online tutorial. Um, that's kind of a records management refresher. So those are two things that um, I think 
county local agencies could benefit from taking a look at. And then that's basically the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you learned a little bit more about the Archives and Records and Administration, about records management in general, and your County Commission of Public Records. Um, and I can open it up now for questions or any sort of issues that you're, you're facing. Thank you, Amy. Um... So everyone, um, for questions, you can either put them in the chat and I will read them out or feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, to get us started, Tamara had a question. Um, she said, local organizations can ask to be added to a list of groups who are contacted when records are being disposed of. How do organizations get on that list? And what's the process if an organization would like to take the records or has questions about the disposal? I did not know about this list. Is it um, a list that each county has but when they're getting disposing so, of records? Amy, when, when I was still in Montgomery County um, with the Montgomery County Historical Society, we were on the list and we got, we got it, was, it was essentially, it looked like a form letter and it, it gave us a list of the records that were being disposed of. Um, and I would pass it along to the county historian um, because she had sort of more familiarity. It was like school records and things like that. Um, and I had asked why we were getting it and they said interested organizations could be on the list. Okay, I think that is part of the county commission. Um, they, and I don't have my, my notes about the commission in front of me, but they do, um, they will have a list of all of those notices of destruction and what records are being destroyed at these meetings. And it's really, I think it's up to each county whether or not they do that sort of list that you're talking about. Um, and it, it's all about, you know, the relationship between government agencies and, you know, county museums and historical societies. So there might, there, there's, like you said, in Montgomery County, it looks like they, they're very, um, I guess more friendly with making sure their records, if, if a local historical society wants them, that they made this list. Um, but I, I don't know if that's for, if all counties do that or not, but that's definitely an interesting idea. I think that if you are a local museum or historical society or archives that wants to be aware of what records are being destroyed, or could be transferred to your institution going to these county commission meetings um, or getting friendly with the secretary would, would help you out with that and just establishing a relationship and a rapport, that sort of thing. A couple of people commented on that in the chat as well. Um, Michelle in Elkhart County said, um, their archivist or archivist just reaches out to some of the uh, some of them when he knows they might be interested, um, but she doesn't think it's required there. And then Amber Gowen in Evansville um, said that she maintains one of those for Vanderburg County, and the county institutions contact her through the clerk's office, and then she will really send out a form letter to all of the agencies. <laughs> And then looks like Mark Smith said he's had a similar experience with receiving notification of records to be deaccessioned by um, governmental groups. That's good. I'm glad there's a lot of counties out there that are being proactive like that. Um, so Joe... Um, said that decades ago, Blackford County partnered with a county in Iowa to preserve each other's records in the event, in the event of total of local loss. What has happened to those arrangements under the new approach? Under the new approach of um... now. <laughs> um, I suppose I would need to talk to. Are they preserving them electronically or like, did you all exchange um, like a hard drive or something? I guess I would need more information to figure out what, what's gone on with those 
preserved records. Or he they... said electronic digital. Okay. Um, I would probably need to get with Blackford County and see what's going on or, um, and just talk further about that. Um, and the electronic records program, Megan Fukunaga, um, she could probably, if that was years ago and we need to update um, or transfer them to a different format of media or something like that, um, she would probably be the best bet to talk to, but, um, but yeah, that's something we're probably going to have to have a longer conversation about. Um, there was another question. It says, this might not be your primary area of expertise, but do you have any advice for historical societies looking to economically digitize historical records? Oh, to digitize historical records. Well, um, the imaging, the state imaging and microfilm services lab, um, I know um, is very economical on their, their costs and that sort of thing. They mostly do microfilm, but like I said, they also do digital access formats. So um, I, I can connect you with Kim in the imaging um, and microfilm services lab. Um, I know there are other, other um, programs and institutions that could probably help um, but yeah, it's a little bit outside of my, my purview right now. And, um, Daryl, in Local History Services, we also have a few resources, um, on digitization. Um, offline, I can put you in touch with Karen, who's done, um, a webinar on that. She's on here, but, um, she can connect with you offline on, about that. Yeah, and like I said, Megan in our electronic records program, she they have policies and procedures. They're not necessarily for like historical societies, but she might be able to to help with um, digitizing those records. I have a question. Can yes. everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize. I had some technical difficulties with the computer I normally use for Zoom. So this is new. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We are, and I should say, um, the county commissioners uh, are who I work for. They're my bosses, and I am the the county archivist. Um, right now, the the clerk, the commissioners, and um, we had a um, county um, auditor that was. Um, can't think of the word, but the previous auditor had to resign before term was over, so another one um, took her place. Um, what's that? An interim auditor? No, no, they don't call it an interim auditor. I don't know why I'm mind blank right now. Um, but nonetheless, um, we are having uh, different companies. Uh, quote, give us quotes um, mm -hmm. to the commissioners uh, and hoping that we'll be able to use uh, some of the readiness funds that are coming to counties uh, to, to be able to digitize and index all of the documents prior to electronic filing for all of our offices. Um, one company that has already came in and spoke with us, they essentially will have a team of people that do what I do, which is scanning in a document, and when you scan that document in, indexing by, you know, putting, you know, brief, brief description of the information that's on there, whether it be parties' names, dates, at what type of document it is, and, and so that can be um, a very time-consuming thing, but these, this company specifically has a team that will come in and get all that going for you. We just send them the images and they, they take care of the rest. 
my question is if you know of any counties that have done this and if you know of any other organizations that will offer this service, it's very, um, it's very important that when we present these quotes to um, the county commissioners, they in turn will um, present that quote to the county council uh, board members, and they're the ones that will um, accept or deny um, our proposal, if we don't have more than one company, and right now we only, we're, we've only we only been able to find one company, it's just new territory for us, and they're a Xerox company by the name of Integrity One Technologies, um, they're, they're based out of Indianapolis, so if there's another company, I would like to know that does this so that we can reach out to them to get a quote against Integrity One, not because we don't like what they've offered to us, but just because we have to prove to the commissioners and to the county council that we've done our homework, essentially, and we have searched, and here are some other options, and this option is the best one. This team will come in and do what we need to do. Did all of that make sense? I felt like it was very lengthy. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um... I'm probably not the best person to ask. Megan Fukunaga with the Electronic Records Program might actually be the pe best person for you to ask. I know she has dealt with, um, she deals with state agencies and county local agencies on um, on digitization and e-records or before, you know, I know you're working on before e-records, that sort of thing. Um, she can give you guidelines on what to look for in these mm -hmm. companies, like what your records need to be, the standards they need to be up to, that sort of thing. So you can ask these companies in their quote or whatever that they need, they need to answer these, um, the, go through these guidelines and make sure that they cover, you know, check all the boxes, that sort of thing. I don't think IARA can specifically recommend certain companies, but she might have a list of different ones that offer the services you're looking for. I'm not right. sure. I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, I can I can definitely say talk to Megan Fukunaga um, and she's the best person to talk to about that. Can and you I, give me any of her contact information and how to spell yes. that last name? It is in my presentation, but her um, email address is M and Fukunaga is spelled F U K U N A G A at I A R A dot I N dot gov. Let me see. I'm just going to click back. That's down okay. If you, if you have it in the presentation, then I'm sure I'll see it. I see that it's been recorded, so that's great. No. I had There's a previous her. meeting, so I was a little tardy. That's okay. There's her information at the bottom. She's um, with the Electronic Records Program, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And Erica, a couple people posted in the chat, too. Um, Amber Gowen said, um, Steve Dix at Pollux, P-O-L-L-U-X, business services might be able to help. Um, Donna Adams said family search from Salt Lake City, Utah will digitize records um, 1930 and earlier. And um, Tamara said you might also reach out to Justin Clark at the Indiana State Library because he works with Indiana Memory and helping organizations prep for digitization projects. Um, so he might know or other organizations that have done that sort of thing. And she put the, um, his email in the chat or um, just let me know and I can send it to you. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question in the chat. Joe asked, um, did the state archives retain very early records in physical form? Um, he said he once held his seventh great grandfather's 1793 will in his hands. Is that kind of thing still possible? Yeah, the state archives um, does keep paper records. Um, so that potentially is still possible. There's, they have um, a digital archives database online that you might be able to search or 
you can contact um, the archives um, and ask, um, ask about that. Their email address is ARC, short for archives, ARC at IARA.in.gov. And one of the archivists will get back to you and they will, um, they will see if they can get you that, get, um, get that paper copy um, in your hand. So if you want to, you can email them and then set up an appointment. Um, the State Archives, I believe we're still requesting with the pandemic and everything going on, if you could set an appointment to come visit, um, that would be much appreciated because you know we can only want a certain amount of people in the the reference area. So um, so yeah, just contact them and see see if we can do that. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, but if you have any other questions, feel free to go ahead and unmute and we'll we'll give it another minute or two to see if there are any others. You did say that the transcript of this uh, conference is going to be emailed to all of us. Yes, it's being recorded, so I will be sending it out um, once the whole series is done, so probably here in the next week or so. That'd be good to share with the rest of the board. Great. Yeah, and if anyone thinks of questions afterwards, uh, feel free to reach out to me, like via email or telephone. Let's see if I can go back to my last slide um, for all of my contact information. Um, and I'll type I'm on, your email in the chat too. Okay. And, or I think um, I did, but I'll do it again. Okay, yeah, um, give me a call or email me. Um, I'd be happy to answer anything or clear up any con confusions that my presentation <laughs> might have given. Um, but yeah. I do have one, one quick question. Um, so if say a local history organization um, learns that the county has disposed of some records um, and they don't, they're not sure if they have duplicates or if they've um, followed all the right procedures or something, um, who do they contact with that? Is that? Is it best to go ahead and start with the local office? Should they contact um, someone in your office to ask, or how does that? Um, I would say figure out where the records came from um, and then talk to that agency about, you know, are these duplicates that you have a microfilm um, of, or are these, you know, um, would you like to transfer them to my, you know, local historical society instead of just tossing them out? And then that's when they, if the agency says, oh yeah, that would be a good idea because they are historically significant or whatever. Um, that's when you might, you know, you can either contact me or we can work with them to fill out that PR1 form and get them transferred. Um, I know there's a lot of kind of, I want to call them emergency situations, but a lot of times agencies will toss them in a dumpster and then you're, you know, at the point of, you know, I need to get them now or what. Um, I think that's a case by case basis, but um, we understand that there are situations that come up like that. So as long as there's a, you know, we can get a paper trail going, I think. Um, that would benefit, you know, the county local agency and, you know, the county museum or the historical society. It's all about um, just that provenance and making sure we, the legal, you know, the legal requirement, that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, they can contact the agency or they can contact me. Hopefully we'll get it sorted out as best we can. Thank you. And Erica had a question in the chat. Any advice on uh, prompting the commission to meet more than once a year? Oh, advice on prompting the commission to meeting more than once a year. Um, they are, by Indiana code, they are only, you know, they only have to meet once a year. Um, I'm trying to think on the spur of the moment some good advice on how to 
how to get them to meet more than once a year. Um, you could you could mention that virtual meetings are always an option now. Um, I know that um, for some reason meeting virtually instead of coming together is a lot easier for a lot of people. They can stay in their office, you know, they don't have to leave. They can eat lunch while attending the meeting. Um, talking to the secretary or if you've got good rapport, um, just, you know, I wish I had better advice um, and I can think on it and get back to you, but, um, you know, legally they only have to do it once. But like I said, I already, we encourage them to meet quarterly or um, ultimately it would be great if they met once a month, but realistically, and it's all up to the, you know, each county is different. Um, I know um, there's some that do meet quarterly, but there's some that only meet, you know, once in July. Um, I think maybe if you know that they're not going to meet, but once a year, maybe um, filling out your notices of destruction and your PR1 form closer to when that happens so that you, um, so that it aligns with that meeting instead of you having to wait for a very long period of time. I don't know if that's helpful, but I'll definitely have to think on that and see, see what we can do. Michelle in the chat had a suggestion. She said you can also point out the records might not have to sit around as long so you can open up some storage space. <laughs> right, right. The storage space, the legal requirements, and then keeping like an effective records management. Those are the three things you can really point out to them is that this is, if you meet more often, it's less burdensome on your county local agencies and makes everyone more happy. <laughs> And um, Daryl asked, how does he find out who is it, who is the local person in charge of the Public Records Commission in Henry County? Um, do you happen to have that name and is it the, the county clerk? Sure, um, I can, I have a list um, and I can look up Henry County. Um, can't do it right now, but I can look that up and get it to you. Um, what was the person's name? It's um, Daryl. If you send it to me, I can forward it along to Daryl. Okay. All right. For Henry County. All right. And the thing with the county commissions is that the secretary, it's either the clerk or the recorder, but it can change every year. Um, so that's why I try to. Um, I work on the yard today. So that's why I try to keep an annual list. And um, for the previous question, Amber also had um, a suggestion. She said, if you can get the office holders or judges on the commission to designate a proxy that's informed, it helps encourage more meetings since they're so busy. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, if you have any questions after the presentation, just let me know and I can connect you with Amy or, or her emails also in the chat. Um, but thank you so much, Amy, for this presentation today and um, for providing all this information. I think this is um, really beneficial for all of us to, to learn about. Um, I know I learned some good things from it, so. Well, thank you for having me. Just let me know if there's any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. And if you've signed up for other presentations in this series or the County Historian Roundtable discussion, um, keep an eye on your inbox and you'll get the Zoom details, um, which I'll send out a day or two before each presentation. So um, thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you on our next meeting. Thank you everyone. <laughs>